We are going live. Just so everyone knows, we are going live on YouTube as well uh, this morning. Oh. Wow, look at that. <laughs> All of a sudden, it just cracked oh. a closure. That's great. Well, um, I know I'm sure some more folks will join us, but as we get started this morning, um, I'll, I'll kick us off uh, with a prayer and then we'll jump in from there. So let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are the bread of life. And God, we also thank you that in your vision of what it means to follow you, that uh, food is actually a part of that. And that in the following of you and in the remembrance of communion and the remembrance of your provision for us, we are called and invited and challenged to be a people who live in such a way that uh, all have bread enough to eat. And so indeed might your spirit uh, quicken our hearts that we might taste and see the goodness of your love and of all of your creation and be a people who then share that one with another. It's in Christ's name that we gather. Amen. Amen. Well, any of you know, uh, this month, we are, our, our ministry of the month is Community Emergency Services. And as a part of that, uh, Michelle and I were talking, we said, hey, let's do something uh, as a community so that it's not just focused on you know, like us being able to partner with CES, but really to have a, a more robust vision and understanding, you know, and, and just thinking about what is, what does food mean to us? Who are we called to be as people? Um, and what are the connections between the daily act, dailiness of our own eating and the way that God is present with and in us and all things? And so um, we this morning are super excited to have with us our very own Chef Jeff, uh, just not our very own. He's very, very uh, illustrious in many spaces. Um, and we've missed you so much in the midst of COVID, not being able to have you make our weekly meals as a part of Meeting House Wednesday nights. And so we thought it'd be a really fun way for us to be able to get to say hi. And and there's during this time, you can absolutely like pop in and ask him questions, all those sorts of things. Um, and before we turn over to him, though, we did want to highlight our Minister of the Month. And in doing that, we're really grateful Kathy Thatcher has joined us this morning to share a little bit about her experience with CES and um, and a little bit of just ways that you also can think about their work and ways that you potentially can get involved. So um, Kathy, thanks so much for being here. We'd love to hear a little bit from you about how you got involved, what you've done with CES. Uh, could you share a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I got started with CES, except for that um, they've been a, uh, a ministry partner of Colonial for many, many years before I, I knew about them. But um, uh, I volunteered there and I got on the board and um, we... I was involved with um, setting it up as a uh, 501c3 uh, organization. It was it was very uh, loose and didn't didn't have much structure before that. And there was a, somebody who was the in in charge of it, and he was um, he was fine. But we eventually decided that it would be a good idea to. Uh, get a different person in charge. And so we went through a, um, a search committee work and we ended up hiring Mike Lloyd to be the executive director. And that's probably the best thing I was, I did for CES. I mean, not, not that I was solely responsible, but that committee hiring him, he has been fantastic. And he has really um, done a lot to uh, move the organization along and to expand what they're doing. And anyway, it's really, really great. Um, just so you know, he is um, in the hospital now. He had bypass, heart bypass surgery this past week, and he's going to be out for 
I think he said four to six weeks. He also mentioned that he had had COVID. So I don't think this heart surgery is related to the COVID, but anyway, um, uh, I'm praying for him and hope that he gets back on his feet very soon. Um, so just a little update on, or you know, explanation on what um, CES does. It is the largest food shelf in Minneapolis. It serves uh, a big area of um, impoverished people. It's, uh, it's building is in on 19th Avenue, I think. Anyway, it's in South Minneapolis and it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's a good building. They have had to obviously adjust their, how they are doing things. Um, instead of having people come in, to the building to get their food. They're distributing uh, it outside and- um, um, 10.30 after this thing's over. Hi, what was that? Oh, okay, I thought she was saying something to me. Um, anyway, um, they also have Meals on Wheels, which is um, providing cooked meals delivered to people who are homebound and they also have food delivery, which is um, delivering food to people's homes that is not prepared. So they, they have to prepare it, but, but it's, if they can't come to the CES location to pick up food, they are getting food delivered to them. So, um, and it is the largest food shelf in Minneapolis. Um, I think I said that already. Um, so they uh, they are currently they have quite a few staff people. They have um, besides uh, Mike, they have uh, Juanita Lingren has been the secretary for as long you know before she started before I got involved. So many 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 years, and they have Chris. Um, trying to think of his last name, who is the, um, uh, he's in charge of raising money, fundraising, and, or, you know, uh, getting donations and stuff like that. And they have uh, several other people that are involved in the, in the process, but they have recently hired, or they want to hire a new staff person who would, they would call it the director of spiritual care to help train volunteers to be, um, you know, to be praying with clients and they, and they refer to the people who come there as clients, which, you know, they're not just down and outers. They're, they're significant people that, that just need a little help. And um, so they want to be able to train uh, volunteers to, uh, to be able to work to pray with people and extend spiritual care to the people that they, um, when they deliver either meals or food to people's homes, um, they want the volunteers who are doing that to be able to um, extend spiritual, uh, you know, minister to them spiritually as well as just bringing them food. And so they want to hire uh, somebody who they would call a director of spiritual care to train these volunteers. And uh, most of the people who they deliver to are homebound. Um, otherwise they would be coming to the to CES to pick up their stuff. And they're, they're, a lot of them are isolated. You know, there are a lot of them are single people. Um, they're, um, so they not only have hunger as issues but they have isolation and so if they, the volunteers could um, be, uh, pray with them and extend spiritual, uh, spiritual care to them as well as just delivering food that, that they, they think that would be a, a really good thing. So that's what they want to do. They want to hire um, somebody to lead that initiative. And that's, um, they have asked you know, for money from many sources and uh, obviously from the people who donate to them regularly, but also I know they have asked uh, for this, 
our blessing initiative and from other, they have other, quite a few other churches that they're mm. involved with. So I think that's, that's great. <laughs> that's what I can think, what, kind of, what I can Thank think of you. at the moment. Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for, for Kathy? Uh, I have also put in the links uh, or in the comments, a link to our mission page, which uh, features CES this month, along with ways that you can get involved. But does anyone have any question? If so, go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I came in late. So were we talking about Meals on Wheels? What, what, what oh, uh, CES. Kathy, that, so it's just in the broad CES. Okay, mm -hmm. very good. Thanks. But it's not Welcome. just, they don't do just Meals on Wheels. They do, you know, the other things too. But yeah. Yeah. That's great. And then Michelle Re also, just so everyone knows, if, if you find the comments, the link for uh, the mission page, but there's also a link for the recipe. But Kathy, thank you so much for, it was fun to hear. I didn't know that you had such a long history working with them. Um, and it's, yeah, just a really great organization and really appreciate the ways in which they engage with their clients and um, glad to hear about the spiritual care position. And so, yep, the, look yeah, for the ways they, you can. They have a long-term uh, history with Colonial. So I, yeah. and I, there are other people that have volunteered there, not just me, but quite a few others over the years. Yeah. So uh, I see some of them on people the can get involved over there. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. All right, you're uh, really welcome. appreciate that. And then I'm going to um, send it over to our chef of the hour. Uh, here we go, Chef Jeff, coming to us live. Where, where are you at today? Okay, I'm here. And so once again, this is all new, the whole Zoom, Zoom community. Uh, I'll just tell you a story. When uh, Sarah and Michelle brought this to me, man, I had this so laid out. Sarah was just going to be my right-hand woman, and she's going to be kind of helping me work this stuff out. And then they said, they were going to do it on Zoom. I said, where are you going to be? She's going to be at home. I said, how's that going to work? So <laughs> still with my ambitious mind, I decided I'm still going to do this uh, meal. And so just briefly, uh, this is going to be a meal that I look at when we're looking at the transforming power of God, the parallels of this food industry and this business and service industry is so great. It keeps me kind of anchored. So uh, we're going to start out with doing this Yankee pot roast. And it's kind of one of these things where uh, when we're looking at CES and all that too, it's going to kind of evolve into what do you do with leftovers? How do you elevate the food? And, you know, how do you transform, you know, just a leftover into something even greater? And I think that's what God does with us. when we look at all the years that have been in our lives, you know, the I call them leftover years and you kind of evaluate like, oh man, gosh, that didn't make me this great or that didn't do me no good. Or I wasted a lot of time, which I usually say to myself, how can God do anything with me? You know, how can he make me even better or how can I do anything greater for him? And so when I was thinking about the menu, I was thinking about this awesome pot roast we have done at Colonial. And I was thinking about all the different ways that uh, we have done it as a business. And, you know, how we had put the wow into the food and, uh, man, made people's days and their events very special. Uh, so I got my friend Mike, and he's going to kind of help um, use the video and get into the hands, but yell at him and say, Mike, I can't see that, man. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to do some cookery and some step-by-step -step stuff. Um, I think there's a chat there, and Sarah, you know, you kind of let me know what they're saying. And... Um, at the same time, Absolutely. little breaks so I can kind of set up uh, some other things. But first of all, I want to thank Colonial. You guys, uh, you guys have been, I've been in the business for 16 years. You guys have been part of my life for 15 years. And I've been with you guys, I think, for 16, 17 years. Uh, some of you guys don't even know that, man. Um, it's very been transforming. I mean, I've been with the ups and the downs with you guys. And one of the things I saw was, Food brings people together. I remember even in the downest times of Colonial, putting a great meal out, I saw bring people together. And uh, I got such a great crew, a shout out to the kitchen crew, past and present, and hopefully future. Uh, you guys have been a great support system. Kitchen crew, one plug, when we get back together, we're not just cooks, man. We pray for each other, we support each other, we laugh together, we cry together. And not only do we pray, but we praise what God has done in our lives through the power of prayer when we get together in the kitchen and have 
you know, great community time. So anyways, That's shout great. out to those guys, man. They're like unsung and sometimes, you know. And if anybody, hey, Chef. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I'm not going to, sorry, I didn't mean to steal your, your thunder there. Oh, and you were going to say, if anyone wants to join in. Yeah. Join <laughs> in. No. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is what it is for me. You guys don't have to come in and do a whole service. Come in for a half hour, come for, in for an hour, man. And sometimes just come in for fellowship. We have guys that sometimes don't do much in the kitchen, but they come in for the fellowship. And man, we welcome everybody to just come in and just have community with us. So great. start so out. Before you really jump in, I just, two things. One is just an encouragement to everyone. If you do have questions along the way, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And we do have a chat before you really jump in that came in from Paige asking, oh. what's the space where you're cooking in today? Ah, Can you this tell is us the space? Uh, we're in Freedom Works actually, and it's a ministry supported by Colonial, uh, with Colonial Missions. So Freedom Works is a place where they uh, help people that have come out of jail uh, and um, through treatment and all that kind of stuff through drugs and tough adversity, but it's almost like a prison uh, fellowship ministry. We've been here for a little over a year. Uh, we've been blessed to be here to work with this program here. And uh, our business is here, but our ministry is also here. So we are partnering with these guys to develop a program, a culinary arts program to help these guys get the skills for them to go on their way out the door and uh, become successful. They have a residency here. There's uh, two types, residency and all kinds of types of programs that are here to help these guys. And, uh, has been very uh, humbling and uh, a joy to work with these folks, man. These are guys that are in the trenches trying to make a difference. We're in North Minneapolis, uh, the heart of North Minneapolis, and uh, I wouldn't want to be in a better place. Yeah, so, um, so uh, Freedom Works is one of our mission partners too. I think we, um, their mission of the month was back in October. So it's a nice overlap here. Amen, amen. All right. So I'm going to come off to the races. First of all, I gave you guys a bunch of ingredients and you're going to work them like you want to work and hopefully we'll give you some recipes, but I'm going to just actually start out with the pot roast. And so Mike, I'm going to have you just kind of uh, bring the camera over and look what I'm going to uh, do. So we are going to use a chuck roast. And the reason why I use chuck roast for our pot roast is because that whole fat and everything in there melts in your mouth and the whole thing has just turns real tender in the cooker. So coming over here, coming over. <laughs> I'm gonna grab my gloves here and then uh, we're gonna get going. And then you might have to just space me out a little bit. Huh? You might have to space me out a little bit. So. Oh no, you're okay. <laughs> So in my hands, I got a nice big piece of chuck roast. And I think in the recipe, I said probably use about six pounds of it, um, you know, because we're talking about doing leftovers. And the thing about this is that, uh, once again, you cook a lot of it, you can freeze it, you can store it. So what I usually do with my chuck roast here, I put a pan on right here, and I'm going to put it on the stove. And I'm just gonna get it kind of hot. All right, so I'm getting my pan kind of hot because I'm gonna sear this chuck roast up. But I'm gonna season it in what we have. Uh, and we do it at Colonial, our special state seasoning. Some of you guys that are watching kind of know. I just kind of liberally do that. And uh, I'll let it sit for just a little bit. And what I usually do for my, I get a demi. And I got a, like a demi. It's kind of like you can buy it at Lund's. It's almost like a beef stock, but it's a little bit more richer. And I use that. And then I use a Shiraz wine. And I love Shiraz. It's just got a, a better body, but you can almost use any red wine that you want. And for me, the key is the searing part and the heat uh, as this goes in. So what I usually do is I heat up my stock. I turn my oven all the way up to about, say, 500. 
And so while I'm uh, searing, getting my stock uh, hot, I am going to just now this get a little bit of olive oil. I'm gonna have to turn it. So I got my pan just really searing here and really hot. And then I am going to put in this and just get it brown for a little bit while. In the meantime, what I'm doing is because this is going to be your dinner right now. It's going to be the pot roast, key lime pie, and mashed potatoes. Uh, just very simple. And we're going to do it with the braised veggies. So I'm going to show you some steps to get that done. And uh, I like to do this ahead of time. You can do this the day before, which would be really great. And then you can put all your other mise en place together. Or if you're just taking a Sunday, you know, you're probably going to give yourself a two to three hour window to do both of these, but you can do them at the same time. Hey, Chef. Yes. Do you ever, we have a question. Um, Michelle asked, do you ever use a slow cooker? Do I use, you know, I have used uh, slow cookers before, but there's something to me about the searing that gives that intense flavor, you know? And I think if you cook something over time, the flavors will come in there. They're uh, great convenience for folks, but, uh, Something about the, the searing of the seasoning you miss in the slow cooking. Uh, Jeff, um, yes. you had mentioned you had mentioned demi. What is that? Demi what? A veal, it's a veal demi. It's kind of like a you know, use the veal and it gels more and it takes more of a body for the beef. It's not really watery. So okay. when I was at Nicollet Island Inn, we used to make a lot of veal stock, not beef stock. And ah. richness to our um, sauces. And a lot of body thickened it up a little bit. Thanks. And so that is kind of going really good here. And so then once I get that together, I got my meat kind of seared and just setting it off into another pan. And what I'm going to do is I had some onions, <laughs> probably about one, one big onion, garlic, probably about oh, six to eight cloves and I just put it right back into this pan like this and then I add a little bit of thyme and bay leaves and let me make sure I got those thyme and bay leaves I add a lot of thyme uh, for this and then all I'm just trying to do is just get this a little bit more brown you know, I'm not, trying not to burn it, but I'm just going to get it really brown and get the pan really hot. And then I am going to add my Shiraz. And I think Shiraz is more of an Australian type of wine, but I love it because it's got a richness and it's got a body. And what I'm trying to do is get my sauce and everything to come to this uh, thickening that I want, uh, not just be really watery. So what I'm going to do right now is... Uh, let this come to a boil, and then you're trying to get your wine to come into almost like a syrupy. So you're kind of reducing this. And so in the meantime, what I am going to do is start with my key lime pie. Uh, sometimes it's graham cracker crust. I already made the crust, so I wouldn't take up a lot of the time today. But you can buy the crust too. So either way, if you do buy a graham cracker crust, you want to make sure you still bake it for about six minutes and then make sure it is completely cooled off. So as I move these stuff out the way, change my cutting board. And, uh, so with the key lime, I got four eggs. This is, I just make a simple one and it's a very simple recipe, four eggs. I got fresh lime juice, about a half a cup. And uh, I got the sweet condensed milk. And that's pretty much all you're gonna need. And then I got my key lime pie, my crust that I baked the other day, so that it be cooled off. Uh, save some time. This is what uh, Sarah was gonna do today. Boy, you got out of some work today. <laughs> so, as uh, this is still going, you know, my oven is still set at 500, um, but if you wanted to do this earlier, what I would have did was set my oven at 325 right away, baked off that crust, and then would have put it up to uh, 500 while this uh, was going on with my beef. 
And so what I'm doing is get my microplane because what I want to do is get at least uh, five teaspoons, maybe two tablespoons of zest for my, uh, what do I show? So just get a little bit of zest for this uh, filling. And once again, my stuff is going, my stock is hot. And the reason why I said this is one of these cool things because this is time consuming, but you can take a lot of your time consuming dinners. And what I usually do and, uh, is say, if this is a time consuming dinner, I am gonna automatically make it for leftovers, make leftovers for this. So I'm already thinking ahead, like what kind of meals can I make for the week? You know, sometimes I'll cook a bunch of pasta just to last me for, you know, a couple of days and then just do different things with the pasta, hot or cold. Here, I think I got about uh, five teaspoons. And again, it's going to get a bowl. Mm. And, uh, I'm back. I am back. So, with that, I'm going to take my zest, lime zest, and then I'm going to take these four egg yolks. Then I'm going to just lift that up until it turns like this kind of cool neon green looking yellow thing. And some of you guys that make key lime pie all the time, you guys probably done this a lot. So just kind of lift that up until you get that nice, uh, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting to turn almost like this yellow green kind of thing here. And then we will back this up a little bit. And now I'm going to use my trusty can opener. Open this up. All right, Mike. Oh, okay. Throw this into my egg and zest mix. This is pretty thick, man, I'm telling you. But we use this a lot in some of our other desserts. Uh, we're not like bakers and all that, but we have some nice classic desserts that we do for uh, with our company. Then once I get that in there, then I'm going to throw the lime juice, which I have here, fresh. And then I'll once again kind of whisk, whisk that again, keep it. Uh, Blend it, and all I have to do, whoops, it's kind of spilling. All I have to do now is let that set for about a half hour. So now, of course, in between all of that, I'm looking, and once again, my, uh, my pot roll stuff, I'm not sure if you can see it, but uh, Mike, I'm not Tilt sure. it down just a little bit. Yeah, I got tilted right, down. Tilt on the camera, there we go. Kind of like, you see that nice gloss, and it's kind of reduced. So now I put my meat back in. And then I cover it with my veal gimme. And foil on top. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll do a plastic wrap and a foil because you sometimes experience where your foil after being on something for a long time might kind of start falling apart or start popping and getting in little holes. So a lot of times I'll just put the plastic wrap first on top and then the foil. Uh, and that way it really does keep in a lot of the steam and a lot of the juices. And then we put it in our oven. Uh, here it comes. Down. Well, so you can see it. Oh, you mean move this down? Okay. Then, right there. So generally, it's a 500 degree oven for probably about maybe 25 minutes, and then I turn the oven down to 300. 
So then you got it, or 325. Uh, once you do the 325, let it cool down and you'll be able to put in your key lime pie, which only bakes for about 18 minutes or so. And so now you got those two things working. So in the meantime, there's that extra thing that I need to do. And that's, I'm gonna make the mashed potatoes just because uh, I got the time to make the mashed potatoes. Jeff, how, uh, so when you turn the oven down from 500 to 325, how many minutes then do you leave it in? Probably about a couple hours. I'm looking for internal temperature of close to 200 so that it can fall off. And then when I take it out of the oven and I wanna cool it off or anything like that, I make sure everything stays in the juices and then we'll just kind of show you how we deal with those juices because uh, that's where our sauce and our braising stuff's gonna end up coming out. But okay. in the meantime, I'm gonna do the mashed potatoes so that we can get that out of the way. Uh, let me see if I can find my peeler. Okay. That was good. I'm back, guys. So, so I'm going to do about maybe two pounds of potatoes here. Uh, easy stuff to do. You know, we do a lot of mashed potatoes for our company. Uh, once again, when we're talking about how to make food elevated, how to make it great, but be still simple about it. Uh, we've got eight different types of mashed potatoes. We're going to walk you through one and so this is uh another thing sarah was gonna do Man, you got <laughs> i got out a lot at yeah. some point this morning too we have a um from barbara she's saying uh, how did you learn to be a chef so at point when you want to share a little bit about how you got into this work wow that's a it's a really good question because uh since i've been doing this so long and you know uh, I almost kind of try to see how did I get into this and it really got to be where when I was a teenager I was working as a dishwasher at the old Dayton's remember the old Dayton <laughs> so that's where I was kind of exposed to food uh, and I worked there for a few years but it was just dishwashing got elevated into a place called Crazy Nicholas and that was it but what happened was is I actually my family knew Mr. Cook Ted Cooks was a Barbecue guys, still got the barbecue joint over in South Minneapolis, Ted Cook's 19 Poles. And there I started working for Ted Cook's, my family and I, and that's where I learned how to barbecue. And it was, uh, all the famous greats came in there, famous Dave's, your mamas, all those guys, they didn't have their own restaurants. So uh, at that time, and uh, we learned how to cook on an open pit. It was just straight fire and a hose turned on the fire. Like, let's see what what? So I'm just trying to, I'm guiding Mike too, man, to keep learning how to do this too. So that's kind of where it started. And then from there, I went to uh, uh, Lund's in Edina. And boy, you know, when I got there, it was just like the thrill of the chase, man. It was so, so much going on. You know, I learned so much about food. I just really loved, it. you know, that aspect of, you know, being able to serve and put out great food. It was so intense. So uh, I really loved uh, doing that great kind of food. And it was, both these places showed how to do stuff in scratch. Both these places showed how to deal with the intensity and, and find the satisfaction of good hard work. Uh, but then my life got into a different turn and uh, it got kind of dark. And so when God was saving me out of all that darkness, uh, I was at uh, Nicollet Island Inn. And from Nicollet Island in, it seemed like God just gave me this revelation of that I'm in the servant leadership type business. And, uh, you know, he developed my spirituality, learning how to serve people and learn how to step up to a level of excellence. And so what I found out that there was so much freedom in this business, when I was at Nicollet Island in, I saw that a lot of folks were like the waitresses and waiters. They were making like $600 a night, man, just doing waitering and waitress. And then on a holiday, they were doing something like, you know, $800, $900 tips. And I'm like, how is that possible? And they were only going to the University of Minnesota. And so what I found out is that because uh, Nicollet Island Inn was this really nice high profile, really did a thing for, on excellence, 
uh, that I saw opportunity, that you didn't have to be a chef or a waiter or whatever. Uh, I saw cross, uh, what I see, skills being able to be transferable to other things in life. And then from there, that's when I decided to say, God, whatever you want me to do. And he just opened up my eyes to just bring people through the business, to get the skills and help me to be a witness, you know, and watch all this stuff parallel. Uh, I try to get out of this business a few times. You know, I really said, God, I don't think you want me to be a cook because it's so stressful, it's so much on my family. Uh, everybody wonders, why do you want to get burned all the time? You know, little things like that. But I saw lives being transformed, you know, when I was able to witness to folks. And uh, so I just stayed in it and decided, hey, why don't I help people get off the streets, get a good job, and then they just don't have to be a cook, or a waiter, or a waitress. You know, most of the kids that were waiters and waitresses were going to the university at Nicollet Island, and they were being doctors and lawyers and all kinds of stuff, but, you know, they had these skills. So that's what kind of helped me stay in there. And what keeps me in it is that I see that we do a lot of things for people through food. And now we have the advantage to feed people, bring communities together. So, and teaching people new skills is such a thrill. Mm, uh, thank you for that. Uh, question um, from Betty Cook. Do you prefer russet or Yukon gold potatoes for mashing? Looks like you're using russet. Yeah, I'm using the russets on this because I'm going to use a couple different things. I love Yukon golds for, uh, you know, a lot of our high-end jobs. But uh, once again, we're going to add something to this. So uh, the russets will hold up a lot better. And so that's kind of why I'll use russets uh, for most of the stuff that we do because we have potatoes that we say are bacon and leek potatoes. We have, uh, you know, some of our potatoes that just have bacon and cheese in it, and the russets kind of hold them together a lot better. We have our carrot gold, which we put gold uh, carrot purees in them, and that's kind of what we're going to do today uh, with this one here. And I saw something about Bill Demi at Lund's. Uh, where to get the field and do you make your own or what do you well, do with your it, field? Uh, would love to do it but we can't afford to do it really you know so uh, we buy it from our vendor and so it really works but i've seen it at lunds i've seen it at byerly's uh, i've seen it at a lot of different places here so i'm going to have my glaze before so I, I have made a glaze before i put a, a link in case someone wants to uh, wolfgang pucks Veal demi glaze, but you can you can also make your own. Yeah, you can make it. Uh, it's worthwhile making. Good luck. So one of the things that you know, and just a tip for our potatoes. Uh, Mike can get this up, and he can I can show you. Uh, when I do my potatoes, there you go, Mike. I think you see it. You know, I cut them in half, but what I usually do, a lot of people will cube them, but I try to cut them as thin as possible because when they're thin like that, they cook a lot faster and they uh, will mash a lot better. So the thicker your potato is, slower it will cook. And a lot of times what will happen is, is that you'll have a lot more starches released in the water. So then when I do this, you might have to lift it up. I put it in the water, but I just usually use barely an inch over that so that if you use too much water, you're just basically cooking your flavor out like the stock. So let's get that here. So one of the things I have done already and got together was how to do the braised vegetables with um, your uh, meal, your, your uh, beef. So I already cooked the, the uh, beef and I'll pull this out. Just do this over here, like that. And so, so if Mike lifts that up, he can show you kind of your end product. And this is a beef, and this is what it kind of looks like at the end here. So uh, you got this nice juice here, and uh, the way I usually uh, Look at that sheen. I think Mike you wanted to show it. This. I think um, you got to lift the pin, or maybe yeah, I, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I see it. So there's a nice. You can see it. 
a nice thickness to this. And so what I will end up doing with this, it's got the onions, it's got the garlic, and to keep it to have the body that I want, I will take uh, the juice and put it in a pan. So, and all the onions, you don't want to get rid of none of this stuff, man, I'm telling you. And then we will move, Mike will move us over to our station. And I'll take a hand wand, and I think that's one of the equipment. You always want like an immersion wand. So an immersion wand, and then I'm just gonna just puree this stuff all up. Like so. There you go. Oh. And you're just trying to get as smooth as possible. And I'll just rinse this off here. Okay. And then we'll go back to the stove. And what I'm going to do is this is going to be my sauce for the beef. And so what I'm going to do is for that, my vegetables, I'm going to add some pearl onions for that. I just love that onion flavor. Put it to that juice. And then what I did was I took some carrots, kind of did a little bias cut on them about a quarter inch thick. And I also did some parsnips. Kind of just give that little sweet flavor. I didn't want to too much. Kind of, so. so here you go, I got it on here and I got the juice. And so what I'm just basically doing is now I'm gonna braise my vegetables and they'll be ready when I get ready to use my uh, beef. Here. Hey, so, Chef, do yes. you um, buy fresh pearl onions or are they canned from Pat, Pat and Cheryl Mahim? Or fresh. And so one of the, the cool thing about us is that, you know, the frozen stuff is not too much of a compromise of the fresh stuff. Uh, but once again, you know, we're trying to be able to use stuff that we have and be able to keep stuff for longevity. And I really never found the difference between the pearl onions uh, fresh or frozen for this kind of application, but it does taste good. So, so I'm going to go and have Mike do a little break, organize, man. So Sarah, if you want to kind of just get in the mix with whatever that thing you do that you do good, <laughs> I'll be listening, but I'm just going to kind of uh, put it on mute so I won't make a lot of noise and set up for the next one. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much so far. Um, yeah, so we'll come back to Chef and he'll bring us a little bit more in to what he's working on and all the things. Um, I'll do this on gallery view there. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here this morning. So one of the things I'm talking with Chef to end that you'll get to hear from him as he, he takes the turn from this original meal, which is the pot roast, the key lime pie. One of the things he has a lot of passion about, which he can speak of, is about not wasting food. And so part of the recipe he wanted, oh, is my microphone not great? Sorry, can you hear me better or no? Okay, sorry about that. Um, my, my hair was in my ear too, so <laughs> it's a little technical thing. Um, so one of the things Chef's really passionate about is not wasting food. And you know, there's a, a pragmatic element to that in his work of, you know, having an event and then you're doing so many numbers and you don't want to throw away a bunch of food. But I think also, as he can name, a lot of that is also really connected to his faith and the sense of what does it mean, um, how God takes the leftovers of our lives and transforms it into new food, but also how, how are we a people who think about um, issues of sustainability and um, utilizing our food? Because um, as many of you know, um, and many of you might know from your own experience, I know from mine, um, 
I throw, I throw more food than I to admit that I do. And this is one of chef's passions is to help us to, to think really intentionally um, and mindfully about the food that we utilize. And so uh, I just wanted to bring us a little bit into um, thinking about in scripture, the arc of food and some different elements. And at any point, you know, you also pop in and if there's things, um, I'll create some space too to hear from you if you have stories of thinking about um, just God's vision and, and food and how that's come together for you. But one of the things I love is that on the day humans are created in the creation story, um, what happens is right away, the day after that, there's rest. And, you know, theologians and, and stuff have talked over time about why that is. And, you know, humans are the pinnacle of creation. But one of the things that Stephanie Spencer of 40 Orchards really illuminated for me was a sense of everything that was needed in the world was already created. And so humans, their first day, it's rest because everything that needed for our well-being has already been formed by God. There's fish, there's birds, there's the land itself, and all of creation already exists and is sustained by God. And just the sense that we're formed in trust, and yet we've lived often in our lives um, like there is scarcity. And yet the beginning of the Bible reminds us that we live in events and that we cared for by a loving creator, and that we're called then to be a people who tend to the earth, and care for it, and the earth isn't a, something for us to just use. It's something for us to engage with as a way of glorifying God and of living faith and life um, amongst creation. And so as you, you know, go through the story of the people of Israel, you know, there's so many moments where you see the importance of faith, just even as last week I was able to talk about the Exodus, Passover, and the festivals in the Jewish community are so tied to, you know, they are harvest festivals and are the sense for all of the people of the remembrance that it's God who cares for them and ensures the harvest. And, and yet we also see in that, that even thinking about this like Leviticus and of Ruth, where the food isn't just, it's not just main. It's something where we leave the of the field so that everyone has food to eat, that the workers can eat as they're going along. Um, and, and this connection even back in, you know, in with the people of Israel, that God is the bread of life and is a bread of life in every single way, which is for our bodies and for our souls. And this sense of even then you forward to um, the prophets and, you know, a big thing in the prophets is that they're calling out the people of Israel to say, you've forgotten to care for the hunger, for the widow, for the poor and the needy. And that this call of our beings is by the bread of life is then to be one where actual bread is available for everyone. And we see this then in Jesus, right? Jesus first recorded miracle. He's, he's at the wedding and uh, trans the water into wine and there's good wine for everyone, not just, um, it's just not for those who have the access to it. I love the miracle of feeding of um, the folks to hear Jesus. Not only is there enough food for them, like Chef Jeff, they get it all in baskets and use it. They use it for their, um, they use it for future for everyone. And um, then, as I talked about in Corinthians, you know, as we come to the Lord's Supper, there's a sense that the food is supposed to be for everyone. And so, those are just some of the things that have really hit me from thinking about the Bible and food. I'd love if you have thoughts or things that have connected with you for you to share. All right, gang, I am back, and a couple of things have happened since I have been back, <laughs> or gone, rather. Um, I'm going to get ready before I go here. I'm going to put my uh, key lime pie together because it's been sitting for, you know, a good half hour. You kind of want to let it sit half hour or longer so it kind of firms up and uh, thickens up and stuff like that. So, Mike, you want to come over this way? So, you're going to have to keep it just so I got my little stuff here, and then I have my crust here. There you go and just kind of throw it in there like so. And like I said, this is about 18 minutes maybe, you know, and of course when I bake stuff or cook stuff, Whatever I put in the oven, I usually do a rotation. So I'm always like halfway through that cooking time. I'll just rotate 
So this is going to go in. And then um, I'm pretty close to my mashed potatoes, but one of the things I do because I like the clean look, you're gonna have to lift this up, is that when I'm doing my mashed potatoes, um, you might be able to see it a little bit here. Oh, you can't. You gotta, you gotta. So there it is. Uh, then there's foam. Sometimes it comes on your mashed potatoes. I'm always getting that foam off the potatoes. Uh, I always keep thinking that most of the time it kind of dirties your potatoes if you want a real clean, clean look. So they're probably going to be kind of almost ready. I think when you get it to break up a little bit. So they're kind of breaking, and then Mike's going to come and meet me around the corner there. So I'm straining my potatoes, just straining and draining potatoes, and then I kind of like to whip, whip them up. You can do the masher, uh, you know, you can use all that strength uh, that you want. Right there and then uh, just put them in if you got a kitchen aid but I usually like the kitchen aid I like to whip a little air in there and of course we have a little bit of because I like the garlic garlic you know, I just put a little granulated garlic in it uh, sometimes you can cook with dark garlic but usually roasted garlic is better a little bit of butter Boom. And for me, a uh, little bit of half and half. It's in between milk and, you know, cream. So just kind of throw it in there. And this is just the process of just putting it right back here. The kitchen aid. And I try to use a whip instead of the beater because I don't want to uh, beat it down too much here. Okay. Go lock this sucker in here. Make sure. There we go. I'm just kind of letting it whip and uh, the mashed potatoes, making sure I get the sides cleaned out and everything like that. In between, uh, got our little seasoning. I'm going to just kind of throw some in there like that. Once again, just making sure the sides are down. And so just kind of keep whipping, man. It's not much to do to it, but once again, uh, our smoked Buddha mashed potatoes are the, the customer phase. Everybody loves them suckers, man, because uh, they got that nice smoky taste, but they're really velvety. So we sell a lot of them through the wedding. All right, almost there. Uh, kind of do a little taste on it. Salt and pepper still. And um, all right. The camera down. Pardon? Could you tilt the camera down? All right. So, kind of got that nice little creamy look there. This is going to be the start of my first plate. So, first plate, just a little bit, and this is how simple it gets. A little bit of mashed potatoes, like so. Uh, but what I wanted to do was jazz them up. So, I'm going to take that back and put a little parsley on there. So, if you have guests, they're going to be like, whoa, man, you know. So just kind of stir it in there. And we always like colors and the wild food again. So, now, when you look at it, it's like a nice little piece there. 
then we're just going to take some of our pot roast right here. Just going to cut off a nice little chunk, uh, whatever size you like. Uh, that's a nice little chunk there. So it's probably about a good six ounces. Stick, stick it into there. Then you're going to take your veggies. First, I usually do a little bit of the uh, gravy, just or the sauce, kind of put it on the plate. And then you just kind of take your veggies, just kind of scatter them on the back of the plate. And then boom. And there you go. Here's uh, your first plate. And that's your first plate. Hot roast. Boom, boom, boom. I ate it. It's Sunday. Oh my gosh, what can I do now to elevate my meal? And that's kind of what this whole thing is about. So what I decided to do was we have carrot puree. And uh, you just put it in your potatoes like so. And then you're going to kind of just mix it in. And you're going to really see that it's going to turn a little bit orange. And you can put as much as you want in there. Uh, first of all, uh, it'd be the first time uh, potatoes can make you see better, you know, with the help of carrots. I'm going to put a little bit more in there. And then uh, once again, you start seeing the color change. And the longer this sets, the brighter it comes. So one of the stories I have is we did a banquet the carrot and this is where a lot of times I will use the Yukon gold so uh, we did a banquet we said carrot Yukon gold potatoes on the menu and guess what people kept thinking they were sweet potatoes and one person actually said these are the best sweet potatoes we ever ate so you know this is kind of one of those things again you put the wow in with your uh get to your guests a meal so we kind of just we'll whip that up So I'm putting this on the plate here. And then with the help of Mike, I am going to take my juice that I had, this, all my stuff in here. So I'm gonna take it over and strain it. Oh. We will just show them. Then once again, I strained all the vegetables out, but I took my uh, juice here, and now I'm just going to put it on here. And now my pie is timer for my pie there. So I'm going to keep my plate a little bit warm here. And what I'm doing is putting the juice on top of the stove, my beef demi. And what we do is we got this Asian demi, and all we have to do is just add a little bit uh, oyster sauce to it. Okay, and I just get, you know, typical oyster sauce. And maybe for, and this is probably a little under a quart, a couple tablespoons of oyster sauce to just kind of give it a nice little boost in the flavor. Nice little sheen. And then I'll just kind of cook that down a little bit for that. And then the other thing that now that I'm looking at is I have this potato here and I still got some left. And boy, oh boy, I'm kind of saying, what can I do with that? Well, I'm going to elevate these potatoes now into what we call our vegetarian meal sometimes, potato cake, or we can look at it as a potato bacon cake. So we do these and sometimes we do these ahead. So all we need to do right now is what we have is roughly about a couple of cups of uh, potatoes now, carrot potatoes. I'm gonna add some green onions. A little 
bread crumb here. And probably a couple of eggs. And because we said we love that smoked Gouda cheese. That. And then we're just doing a little bit of uh, seasoning when you get it all mixed up. So I'm going to start mixing it up and you can mix it up by, I like to do it by hand because I know for sure that I'm going to get it all mixed up in there. And so then once again, I'll just take them. Oh yeah, the bacon. This one will have bacon. A little bit of bacon. We'll just go and again. And what I'll do with these before I, you know, cook them off. This is something you can do at home. I'll take them, I'll mold them and shape them, and then I'll just put them in the freezer for to eat later on some other time. So this is kind of one of those kind of things where. You, you think ahead of time, you can just make sure you're planning all your meals out or you can just a light little snack. Mix this all in here. Now you can see how orange is starting to come up a little bit more. I just got that. All See it like that. Uh, making uh, little potato cake balls. A couple of just kind of see them. And then I'll just flatten them out. Flatten them out. And these guys will go into the freezer. Um, a little Asian sauce is uh, what we call the Asian Jew. It's kind of thickening up right here. So what we're going to actually do is blanch a couple of asparagus so we can just kind of elevate that dish. And uh, while that's going, if there's questions, I can answer some right now. Yeah, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions about anything that's happened so far with what Chef Jeff has shared. I just saw somebody say they love the Thai market on 25th and Nicollet. Yeah, I love that place, man. Uh, the story behind that is we've been going there forever. And um, one day I just kept saying, man, I don't know because you got the ingredients that are in Chinese or yeah. whatever. And so I just was just picking them up. And the lady, I just called her mama son because she always says, you must be a good chef. I was at the line. She said, you're a good chef. And I said, how come? She said, because you buy really good ingredients. And I'm like, oh, good. I, I couldn't read nothing on there. <laughs> this is great. Man. I love it. So, um, yeah, that's a great place, man. It, uh, is it Shang Her, right? That's the one you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. And they're always really helpful. There's usually someone there who, yeah, like a younger person who usually speaks more English. And so they can explain what something is. But yeah, I like to go there and buy. They have a lot of fresh fruits that you can't find other places and then sauces. Right. And you know, one of the cool things about them, guys, is this is, I love the cultural <laughs> diversity. And sometimes when we're in America, we're thinking cultural diversity, black, white, you know, uh, white, red, black, red. But this is a place where they have a lot of Latinos. And so Latinos are a lot in the back house and they do a lot of the work, but it's amazing when you're watching them speak uh, Vietnamese and Latinos trying to talk and communicate and train each other on the uh, cash register and stuff like that. And it's so cool just to watch that kind of culture kind of come together. You know? so, um, I get a kick out. That's what I love about food, man. It just brings people together. Hey, Jeff, this is Gussie. Uh-oh. I finally figured out how to do this. I got messed up on my little cell phone, but my internet was having problems on my big uh, uh, screen. But anyway, I just wanted to tell everybody that Jeff catered that same meal at Christmas and everybody, well, it was just the four of us, loved it, loved it. So I want leftovers, Jeff. Love you. 
Oh, did you do all this with your leftovers? Now I want your leftovers. <laughs> all right. Well, so I put asparagus in. Hi, guys. Hi, Gussie. <laughs> Hi, Gussie. So I got a little pan on for what I'm doing right now. And, uh, I like to blanch my asparagus and some of my vegetables because it keeps that bright color. But basically, it's a simple, you know, simple saute, a little oil in my pan right there. And, and then uh, just put my asparagus, you know, right in the pans there and just kind of let it start coming and I use uh, oil, but sometimes to speed up the cooking process of my veggies, I'll just have usually a squirt bottle of water also and just dash it with that and it'll steam it. So then all of a sudden your veggies will come out a little bit brighter still and not cook as much uh, as much time in there. So, so hey I'm Chef, gonna... we have a question. Yeah. We have a question here from Pat and uh, Cheryl Mahane. If you want to cook ahead um, your mashed potatoes, would you cook and hold or mash and hold? How, how do you keep them from getting gluey? Uh, well, I cook a lot of our mashed potatoes ahead of time. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll kind of plastic wrap them, you know, and I just do a saran wrap and plastic wrap them and keep them in there, keep them tight. And then if I need them, I just poke a couple of holes into the plastic and throw them in the microwave on a dish and warm them up a couple of minutes. You know, but I've had mashed potatoes that can hold up for, you know, probably five days or so without, you know, losing anything. So I'm going to take our other plate now. And uh, I got to taste this sauce to make sure I'm telling you the right stuff. Yeah, boy. Oyster sauce makes a big difference, man. I'm telling you. So it just kind of just brings that pot roast juice to a different level. And so I'm gonna take my plate, which I have now the carrot gold mashed potatoes, basically. Got my asparagus. And of course, everybody loves asparagus. And then once again, Cut off a hunk of that leftover beef that I had. That I had. And then once again, I'm going to say to myself, well, what? what can I do with that leftover? And I'm just going to cut it out. And you can cut this almost like a steak, too. Uh, once again, can you tilt down the camera. There we go. There. We, oh, that's looking good. So I'm just going to just take this and take this piece and I'm going to just kind of slice it. Little slices. And it's almost going to look like a steak. And I got my asparagus there and this there. And I'm going to come around that corner there. Oh, like so. And then I'm going to. Tomato. Once again, not too much difference in the color of the sauce, but the oyster sauce does add a sheen and you can kind of tell how shiny that is. So it makes it just look like one of those fine dining, you know, restaurant type stuff. And then you can kind of drizzle it over. And I think I might have a little something. Okay, there it goes. Okay. Oh, I thought I had my garnish for that, but I don't. But what I'm going to do is just kind of set it off a little bit. Just so it looks a little nice, and then we will wipe it off. Then you just have a nice little sheen. With it. You're going to have a look at it sometimes. There. There you go. That is beautiful. That's cool. And so I was going to get you to one other dish, but I'm not going to because that's the potato cake. 
But I'm going to show you, man. So here you go. You do your pot roast Sunday meal, got leftovers. Boy, you got company coming over. You're going to elevate that pot roast in there. Man, you got something like a tapas thing going on. So you say your potato cake, a little bit of the beef, and then you can take that sauce. And sometimes what I do is I poach cranberries in there and throw a little bit of pork. And then that'll go really good with your potato cake and your little beef. But this is the one thing that I really love about this uh, recipe too, is that you can take this beef and like, uh, and then over. I'm gonna grab some bowls here. And uh, basically, I'm gonna kind of shred it. You know, just kind of shred it like you're doing a, uh, it's pork, barbecue beef. What we're going to turn out, this is going to turn out to be. And my goodness, man, with this flavor and all the stuff that's in there, you'll be like, oh my gosh, people are going to want to pay to come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Or you can charge them, man. So I'm going to spread the beef up. Michelle. Yes. Can you ask Jeff how to do the mashed potatoes with the carrots? No, don't ask him. Say right the recipe. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the mashed potato and carrots. Yeah, okay. um, Andrea, what was your question? Um, how do you do the uh, carrots with the mashed potatoes? We missed okay. that. Make yes. it on. Yeah, the carrots is why you're cutting up carrots. You'll have leftover carrots, maybe, hopefully, and then you just put them in very little water, almost like the mashed potatoes. Uh, I don't even add salt to them. I just cook them down as far as I can. And then I puree them up, I drain them, puree it up. And, uh, and a lot of times I'll throw it through a wire strainer so there's no lumps so they can blend in there smooth. And you can make a batch of that and keep that in the freezer also coming down the line, you know, if you want something else to eat there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So basically I'm gonna show you a simple barbecue sauce that we make. It's called our poison, poison barbecue. Mm. So, uh, so I just take a barbecue sauce, famous days, or something close to neutral. This is uh, that one I just trying it out. This natural sweet one. Uh, Ooh, yeah. I see. Uh, got less fructose and stuff like that. You know, people are kind of these days. Change the here. Mm. We open a couple more minutes. You're gonna take, you know, probably about a cup. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Uh, then you're gonna take a little bit of poison sauce, which uh, we get from that Shanghai. Uh, maybe about a couple of tablespoons, something like that. And then you're gonna take a little bit of the orange juice. I just take some orange juice, regular orange juice. Sometimes I use concentrated orange juice. But, and kind of mix that in. A little bit, kind of stir it. Stir it in, and it's just kind of a, what we call our orange poison barbecue sauce. So, let me make sure that's on. Yep, you want hoisin, but you don't want it too hoisin-y, you know? You want it beyond the barbecue sauce that you put in there. And, for you guys that are proud barbecuers and old schoolers, a little shiraka, make your hot sauce. Don't have to have it though. Then you just kind of toss it in with your shredded pork or a shredded beef. I mean, it doesn't look like your shredded pork. Jeff, Jeff, how much orange juice did you put in? Just like a. Uh, basically, for that cup, about maybe three tablespoons at the most. It helps brighten it up, and that's what you want. And from my experience, it's different barbecue sauces. Some are a little bit heavier in body and flavor. So, you know, I start out with a couple of tablespoons, and the orange juice kind of brightens it up a little bit. So Thank that's you. That's kind of where you want to go with it. And I think um, I'm going to pause for the cause, and then I'll have a plate ready for you guys. Uh, Sarah, if you want to take over, I know i got a couple of minutes, and that'll be our final plate. Great, I'll just invite everyone, if you have anything uh, you want to share about your own thoughts about beef and food and 
um, how that's opened up for you. Michelle had put in the comments um, from Kim that she loves that after Jesus died and the disciples went back to their old ways of fishing, uh, the night that they caught nothing, um, Jesus shows up and tells them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. And then they're filled with fish. And then Jesus cooks for them and feeds them just as he calls to us, us to him and feeds us. Yeah, other, any other perspectives or things that have really opened up for you in thinking about how your faith animates how you think about food and approach it? Feel free to jump in if you want. Well, I'll share another thing that um, I, I taught spiritual formation at United Seminary for a number of years. Um, and one of the, my favorite opening devotions that someone did was um, a mindfulness exercise tied to eating food. And we did a whole practice of, you know, you think about prayer and um, if you grew up in a home or if you have a practice where you pray before eating, of just that remembrance that the food, it, you know, comes from so many hands and so many people and the land that, that makes it possible and ultimately then from God. And, and she led us, um, the student led us in this practice then of, of just really pausing and, and engaging in the process. We ate an apple with honey and engaging in that whole process is actually to pause and to slow down and to like have that whole experience be one where you're like literally tasting and seeing the goodness of God. And it, and it was, it was like a prayer. And I, like, while I was eating it, I actually started like teared up um, just recognizing how much, how utilitarian often I can be in approaching food. But when I pause and let myself sink into the gratitude and the beauty of it, how it can become its own experience of, of worship and of mindfulness and of just recognizing the presence of God and God's provision and um, the life and the gift that, that it really is. Debbie, you did something like that with an orange. I muted you. Oh. Yep, it started with sitting and looking at it, which is an interesting exercise, you know? We'd, I don't think we ooh and ah over how pretty a plate is, but I don't think we really look at the food um, it was very meaningful. Thank you. Anyone else, other things that have come to mind for you or approaching the way you think about food or sustainability or food and um, gratitude? I think another story for me is um, I was doing happy hour with a friend a long time ago now, but, um, and we were both in seminary and we had bread and wine and it was the first moment like that. It really hit me. Cause I think I had always thought of communion as being the thing you do at church once a month. And that was the first time where it really hit me that like every single meal um, can and, and indeed ought to be that space of remembrance and it was just this most, it was like the most magical, <laughs> magical food experience. And we, we actually like ended up saying to each other, this is, you know, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And we just, it was like, again, I cried. <laughs> so I actually have a history of crying when I, I really sit with food. I've cried because uh, one time I ate this lemon tort and it was the most beautiful thing I had ever eaten. And I was like, <laughs> so I don't know if anyone else even has experiences of crying while eating food, but um, food food is a real gift. Hey guys, I am back and I'm going to do the final, 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 this is the TV football game, whatever, on Saturday to kind of round off your week. So we start out with the barbecue sandwich. And so that's what we're going to be making is a barbecue beef sandwich with a little bit of something to go with it. So I... So this is what I did with the key lime pie 
to say, if you want to elevate with your orange potatoes, just get a circle cutter and just take it. And I had a little bit of a, a little bit of what? So I yeah, saved up the crumbs of the, uh, the pie. So basically what I just did was say, I'll just kind of sprinkle around and just kind of make it look a little nice. And then just do a little bit of whipped cream on top like so. And voila, man, if you have a mint leaf, you can just do that. And of course, if you cut it out, you know you're gonna eat the scraps, right? So you're gonna eat that up. So it's not just a regular piece of pie. This was a, a pie that came out of the oven. And so you dollop whipped cream around it, do a little bit of lime zest or whatever you want. That's gonna be good eating. And so with this uh, final touch, because it is barbecue and it's kind of like a poor boy sandwich, I'm gonna take so I'm gonna just put a little coleslaw. I'm gonna have a pound of that. We do a little sugar, keep a little bit of sugar. We add that in there. And sometimes get it that bite because we call it our Asian slaw. We're gonna okay, no. put a little bit of horseradish, and sometimes people put wasabi in it. And you can just leave the camera down on the food. That's a great view. And it's a little mayo or a lot, depending on how creamy you want it. And uh, just kind of stir that in there. But kind of what I do for the vinegar is I add a little bit of rice wine vinegar. You'll find rice vinegars. You'll find wine vinegar, but you want rice wine vinegar. It's got a little flavor and seasoning to it. Just a couple tablespoons of that. And I think we make that one at Colonial also. So just to add a little pizzazz, we will just take a little bit of cilantro. Let's tear off a little bit like so. Chop it up. Into your bowl. Voila. We call it kind of like our Asian style coleslaw. Of course, you just want to maybe. Uh, so then you might add a little salt and pepper, just depending on where you're at. I got a little bit of a couple of Hawaiian rolls right here. So cut those open, cut those open, and then you lay it out. A little. Where are you? Oh, there you are. There's uh, some on there, like so. And you can do a little jalapeno peppers or something like that. Sometimes you do a little bit of cheddar just to kind of brighten it up. Then just a little bit of coleslaw. This is one of my favorite things you make. <laughs> and boom, so there you go. I'm gonna kind of lay it out for you guys here. Uh, Mike's gonna, I hope, pick up the camera and show it here. So you have your pot roast, beginning to the middle. So you have your, you gotta step back. Go. There you go, your pot rolls, the beginning, at the end, and in the middle, and then you have your key lime pie. And all these things you can do all kinds of stuff with. Uh, you can be very innovative with it. Um, you can stretch it out. And my whole thing is it's food. You don't want it to go to waste. And if you plan well, you know, um, you'll have food for, you're not used to, I don't use I'm gonna put it down. Yeah, <laughs> Mike's kind of trying to work this, so. I'll have food for the week. So, man, thank you guys for having me aboard, and thank you for uh, bringing me on, Sarah and Michelle. And, uh, it was Absolutely. great. Absolutely. We're wondering who you're feeding this week with all this oh, goodness. Gosh. Well, we're feeding. <laughs> well, this, I think me and Mike probably will eat, 
but uh, we're feeding the RH. There's uh, the residency here. So this week we are feeding these guys. Uh, the program has grown from like two to 20 now. And so we do lunch, breakfast, and dinner for these guys seven days a week. So uh, it's part of what the program is. And hopefully that'll translate where we can bring some of the guys on to, you know, give them skills, work in the kitchen. Oh, they got a, got a, we got a couple of weddings, believe it or not. So, so that's kind of mm. our week in advance here. That's great. Let's hey, then, uh, oh, go ahead, Andrea. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Um, my neighbor's teaching me how to make beef barley soup today. Oh, sure. That's pretty fun. That's awesome, Andrea. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Well, um, just two things as we close out. Eight, you know, thanks everyone for being here. And Chef Jeff, thank you so much. Thank you to Michael for doing the camera work. Uh, thanks to Kathy Thatcher for sharing about CES. And as a reminder, through the 31st, um, we'll be intentionally highlighting the Ministry of the Month with CES, and you can find out ways that you can connect with their work. And then join us next Saturday, our very own emerging adult um, Associate Minister Leah Appleton, who makes the best scones I've eaten in my entire life. We'll be sharing a, a breakfast recipe, her savory scones with us. Um, but before we go, Chef Jeff, um, I'd like us all to say a prayer of blessing for you and of gratitude and just as you continue your good work. So let's close as a way of um, blessing and um, giving thanks for this food and for this space. So loving God, we give you thanks again that you are indeed the bread of life. And for our brother, Chef Jeff, we give you thanks. God, for the ways in which in the most, um, the times where it looked like there was no door out, you have been a door in his life and he indeed has then been a door of life for so many. So I pray that in this next season that you will continue to be with him and his family. Be with those to whom he comes alongside of and ministers that they might likewise know that you are a God who doesn't throw anyone out. You are God who makes beautiful things of all of our lives and wondrous creations of many different flavors. And so might we indeed then be your people reflecting the bounty of your goodness and resting in your love and sharing the gifts of creation one with another so that all might have bread and for our bodies and our souls. Be with our brother, Chef Jeff, and with all those who have gathered this day. In your name, we go forth. Amen. Well, thanks everyone for being here. Thanks again, Chef Jeff. Yeah, thank you guys. Good seeing some of you faces out there. Craig, look at you, man. Oh my gosh, Mary and David, and the crew and all of you guys, man. Uh, hopefully we'll be get together soon. Yep. And if That's you want great. to visit the kitchen, just raise your hand or get a hold of me and maybe we'll have lunch in here.